All right, I'd like to welcome you all to the last uh, session uh, of this wonderful uh, retrospective. And it's a real pleasure to welcome back here at the LMB, Daniela Rhodes. Uh, Daniela was a group leader here for several decades. Uh, she started uh, with Aaron in 1969. I wasn't even born. I have very few opportunities to say this this day. So forgive me for <laughs> grabbing this one. And she, she started as a PhD, as a technician, went on to do a PhD. She did se seminal work on the uh, structure of tRNA as well as the core nucleosome, as we've heard uh, throughout the day, and then uh, focused on uh, an entire career almost on, on um, structural studies of, of the chromosome. So it's a, a real honor to have you here today, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. We're born quite soon after that, weren't you? So it's it's a, I'm actually very honored to be speaking at this. And it's also wonderful to see so many, and I'm saying old faces. <laughs> <laughs> I can say this because I'm one of those old faces. Um, and I also want to say that I think, you know, I owe my career in science to Aaron because I came across Aaron when I was very young and from him, I think I learned about how to go about asking scientific questions and how to do science. So as Anne said, I arrived at the LMD in 1969. I did not come to Cambridge for science. I, I married a young Englishman and I needed a job. And I won't tell you how, but I got an interview. Aaron interviewed me and he gave me a job as a technician. I knew nothing about molecular biology. I had done a degree in chemical engineering, but before the interview, I decided to actually try and find out what, what is molecular biology. So, and I got a textbook and I found this name, A. Klug in it, but it did not occur to me that it was the same A. Klug who was going to <laughs> interview me. And my memory of that interview is it was a very odd interview. Aaron stared at the floor almost entirely the whole time he, he talked to me. And, but he did, I remember him ask him asking me one question. He asked me, uh, what subject did you enjoy most when you were doing chemical engineering? And I said, physical chemistry. And I suppose that was it. So he, he, he offered me this position and I started uh, to work on the structure of the RNA. Um, I was actually not working directly with Aaron because the person who was supposed to look after the biochemistry of tRNA, in other words, purifying tRNA and crystallizing was Brian Clark. And I'm also grateful to Brian because he was actually never here and he didn't seem to know very much. So, <laughs> so, so, so from the very beginning, I understood one thing, if I want to do anything, I have, you know, use the centrifuge, I had to figure out how to do it for myself. So I think that was a very good beginning because I had to start thinking for myself. But that, and then I was housed in uh, 305, the virus lab upstairs. And, you know, one end of the lab was Linda Chapman chopping up tobacco plants to make tobacco mosaic virus. Across from her was Uli Lemley working T4 phage and inventive Lemley gel and Jonathan King. And then on the other end of the lab I was was Joe Butler and Tori Durham figuring out the assembly of tobacco mosaic virus. And then of course, at the end of the corridor was Fred Sanger trying to figure out how to sequence DNA and say some Milstein and antibodies. So, you know, I landed in an amazing place and I didn't know, I mean, a priori where I was landing. And I started working on tRNA, which involved purifying tRNAs. And I think we'll say first three years wasn't really science at all. I spent all my time doing filter binding assays because we were purifying tRNAs. We run, for the young people here, our columns were 12 liter gra gradients that run at 30 ml an hour. So it would take weeks to run. Uh, so we purified, purified uh, several different tRNAs from beta steromophilus with the idea that 
thermophile would have more stable structures. And we got the most beautiful crystals. And invariably, John Finch would come to the X-ray and come to the lab, smile, and say that there, there, there was no diffraction. Um, then a, a, a postdoc with Aaron, Jane Crawford, later Dagner, uh, had the idea that she would hopefully get better crystal if you make the RNA dimers. And we had purified glycine in the lab, and you could buy off the shelf from Bergen Mannheim yeast tea, and they had complementary codon, codon uh, anticodon. So the idea was that you would pair the two anticodon loops and you would get dimers. And we got crystals. The crystal looked absolutely terrible. They were all striated, very thin. But one day in desperation, Ray Brown, who had also joined as a technician shortly after me, decided to shoot these crystals. And in, this was the day when he took pictures on film. Uh, and he went to the cabinet, drying cabinet, and he found this image, photograph, extra diffraction pattern went to three Armstrong and he spent the next couple of hours going around structural studies asking who has taken my film. Because he, <laughs> he, he couldn't believe, you know, after so many failures. And, and then we analyzed the crystals and um, it turns out they only contain this C. And then there was a problem. Uh, there was a problem because Alex Rich uh, uh, at MIT had also grown crystals that diffracted from this alanine tRNA. And so, uh, it, you know, in those days, scientists had more, more, I would say. So we had this meeting saying, would it be would it be all right to join in this race because we both have crystals of yeast tea? And I remember Aaron saying something at the time I didn't understand, but he said, we have a monoclinic crystal and they have a thrombic, and therefore we are going to get better data. So that, so we joined in the race. And then, uh, and, and this you can see, only show the papers. Uh, I'm not doing this long. I can't see anything. Anyway, in so we we crystallized about six or seven different RNAs. Was like in 1972, and then um, it was actually reasonably fast. Uh, we got the three angstrom structure in in 1974. So after getting crystals, the big challenge was how do you make derivatives to get phase information, because this is the first crystal structure of the nucleic acid. So we didn't know, you know, it wasn't like learning from the protein crystallography. And I can tell you that between Ray Brown and John Finch, they took 800 procession photographs to try and find derivatives. And the first was actually Aaron's idea that so the, it's an example of Aaron's knowledge. We use a platinum compound called diamino diafluoro platinum compound, which is actually the drug that is still used in cancer treatment, the platinum compound, because it's sought to cross-link DNA and, 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 and stop replication. And indeed, that was our first derivative because it binds to GG uh, pairs in, in tRNA, in the anticodon. Anyway, it, uh, and we would, in those days, to find derivatives, take a professional photograph, and we would have to look at the intensity of the spots per eye. And in fact, we didn't think we had any derivatives because what we had not understood or considered, at least I have not considered, is that you have, you know, tRNA is 76 nucleotides, you have 76 phosphates. So we, we expected to see reversal of intensity in X-ray diffraction pattern, but instead we eventually discovered we had intensity changes of the spots. And once we had discovered one derivative, we soon realized we had another three or four. Um, and I personally, I mean, I grew all the crystals. I went 
we, we knew that magnesium would be very important for the folding of the RNA. And I went through the whole lanthanine series because lanthanines, the diameter of the ions is very similar to magnesium. And the idea was to replace magnesium ions in the lanthanines. So I can't get this pointer to work. So another thing I realized, of course, is this was early on. Uh, the, I had no, all my slides are somewhere in some MRC storage. I had no, I couldn't show you any of the original work. I only found this uh, drawing showing, you know, that the, that's a cl classical cloverleaf representation of the RNA and the arrows show the interaction across the arms of the tRNA in the folding. And actually, when I arrived in the lab, Mike Levitt, because it was his first folding problem, had proposed that there would be base pairs between the tissue delivery <coughs> and the hardware you look. And this structure that's shown here with temperature factor, we actually accidentally redid the tRNA structure 25 years old from the original structure. And because I had, as you can see, we had 15 year, 15 year old crystals. And uh, I, one evening I was in the lab trying to write a paper and Luca Giovanni came to me working with Kyoshi saying, I'm going to the synchrotron station tomorrow and I have, I have no crystals. I said, you know, I always wanted to know how far our TRNA crystals diffract by synchrotron because this, our data was all collected in house and extra generators. So he took some crystals and we got data to two angstrom. And so we had to resolve the structure. And what was interesting at the time, we have to write it up, was that in 15 years time, we had a magnesium dependent cleavage of the RNA. So it was very relevant because at the time, lots of people were working on ribosomes. So we could actually see the mechanism. We could see the resolution is so good that you see the hydration shell around the magnesium ion. You see an OH pointing to a missing bond, and we knew where the cleavage was. So the, this is the RNA, but it's from the structure 25 years on. And you can see the little uh, balls of magnesium ion. You can see that the most stable structure is the center where the magnesium ions hold it together. And this, I don't know if it was shown, this is a picture from where we were building the, those days we built the structure in Richard Box. And that's John Finch, Aaron, and behind is Brian Clark. And sticking out there, it's the CCAM molecule. And so then, uh, that was 1974. I had done several site projects on TRNA, like, um, looking at uh, chemical reactivity to confirm that the structure in solution was the same as the structure in the crystal. Uh, and then because I worked on the RNA, so 19, uh, like 1974, Roger had left the lab. And by then he, had the, he and Jim Thomas had defined the nucleosome core particle that was a hist an octameral histone wrapped by two wrapped by DNA, um, about 140, 150 base pair of DNA. And because I worked on tRNA, Aaron asked me, would I like to crystallize the nucleus? I'm trying to crystallize the nucleus. So I did. And actually, the strategy for crystallizing nucleus is it's essentially the same as for tRNA. If you work with nucleic acid, you, you learn soon, I mean, it's obvious. The first thing you have to do, you have to neutralize the charge on the ribose phosphate backbone, Other, otherwise the molecules will repel each other. So I used a combination of sperming, sperming and, and magnesium to crystallize the RNA, and I started uh, uh, precipitating nucleosomes with divalent ions. And the first crystals I got were just nucleosomes and divalent ions. And uh, should say, so Roger had left so uh, we knew what the nucleosome core consisted of, but then the big job was, how do you make enough homogeneous material from native sources? Remember, this is pre-protein expression, pre-restriction enzyme. And Len Lutter arrived in the lab as um, a first stop, and his job was 
to make as homogeneous nucleus on particle as it was possible through further digesting the nucleosome with macrococcal nucleus. And I think the first PEP lens gave me, I got sterilites. And the second PEP, I got crystals. Um, and uh, uh, working on this also gave me the opportunity to, we had group meetings, always had group meetings, but these group meetings were jointly between Aaron and Francis Crick. And I must say, as a young person watching the interaction between the two, you know, and being pre pre present at this meeting, they were mind blowing. They would come out of this meeting, take the rest of the day to recover. <laughs> and anyway, I, I have a story about a particularly memorable meeting. Uh, Francis was going off to some conference and the meeting was discussing what should be revealed at this conference. And, at, and uh, it went on and on at the end, Francis said, anybody else has anything to say? And I said, yeah, uh, I think I've got crystals of the nucleosome core. And it's a very good way of getting the attention of the whole room, particularly yeah. Fran Francis' attention. And so he said, get up there and tell us, you know, what you did. And I said, I'm, I'm absolutely sure it has to be nucleosome core crystallized because all I have is nucleosome buffer and magnesium. And then that afternoon, so John Finch went off and took pictures, EM pictures of the edges of the crystals. And we could see the nucleosomes lining up. And before I, I explain the picture, and late in the evening, it was seven o'clock, Aaron walks into the lab and says, Congratulations, you know, there are really crystals of the nucleosome. Even John Finch was excited. Yeah. So for you, for people who know John Finch, you know, he was a wonderful scientist, wonderful person, but so I mean, you need people like John Finch, he was so level, but even John was excited. So uh, I don't have it don't have a point. So at the top, you have nucleus on core crystals, absolutely beautiful. They're incredibly biofringent because they're full of DNA. And then um, I think Caroline showed this picture, but that comes from my thesis. Uh, this picture of the columns of nucleus on lining up. And if you, I think what's amazing now when I go back and look, if you look at that image, I mean, John was such a master at taking me in picture, even negative stain, that you can actually see the two gyres of DNA in the eye at each single molecule. And then at the far end, you can see the crystal packing, you know, that you have hexagonal packing of the nucleosomes, the, the, the disks. And, and this is uh, neutron scattering, where we matched out the protein and you can see the gyres of DNA and how the crystals uh, pack. And again, the divalent ions were essential. And what's amazing is I got the first crystal with magnesium and, the, and then the crystals we use for the structure of manganese and I also use calcium. And the unit cell, uh, one of the unit cell dimensions is entirely dependent of that, on the divalent ion. The manganese is the smallest because you get two nucleosomes stacking head to tail and it's 110. But with magnesium, it's 330. So the layers of nucleosome in the hexagonal lattice rotate depending, just depending on the tiny divalent ion. And with calcium, it's 600. So, um, and again, of course, you've got the crystal. The crystals have to be huge because we, we, we only had in-house uh, generators. Synchrotron had not come along yet. Uh, and we didn't want the resolution to be limited by the size of the crystals. Um, and again, uh, had to think about how to make heavy metal derivative. And I think we, it was the first time probably that heavy metal clusters were used, which then were used for the ribosome. To, to get trace information. And you already seen this picture is from the electron density map at seven angstrom resolution, where we could start identifying 
structures within uh, the electron density map color coded for um, H2H to H2H be uh, red and yellow. And, and you know, most of you know, Aaron used to often start a sentence by saying, not many people know this. And I'm gonna tell you that what, what not many people know is the histones got their color from, one day Aaron asked me, go down to store and get some, uh, what are they called, pens, you know, the felt tip pens, or, you know, so that we could color in the map. And all stores had was yellow, red, green and blue. So the only decision we had to take was what would be yellow and red and what be. So that's how uh, the, the tetramer, H2H or tetramer, which you don't see here, but you saw in some of the slides, is blue and green and H2H2B are, are uh, uh, <laughs> red, red and yellow. If stores had had different colors, <laughs> they, they would have been different. And also at the same time, of course, we were trying to um, get the structure of an octomer. And I set up crystals and I didn't get crystals, but I got this nice helical structure so that then we could do helical reconstruction and get the structure of the histone octomer uh, at low resolution. And I put this slide in this morning because I was reminded of Aaron's all early work, like it was back in the thick file. Um, and I really like this picture of Aaron holding the, in this instance, the nucleosome, which is shown here. You can see the, so this is the balsa wood model of the histone octomer. And um, with, with plastic tubing wrapped around and the location of the fit histone H1. And uh, to go back a bit on history is, which I didn't cover. So originally people found uh, this micrococcal repeat pattern, which is 200 base pair. When Roger Kronberg and Marcus Snow were digesting chromatin, they saw two stops in the digestion. One is about 160 base pair and then one at 140. And when you go from 160 to 140, you lose the fifth histone. Um, and one thing uh, I should have said earlier, part of lens work, so we knew from DNS1 digestion Marcus Snow that the DNA had to be on the outside, not inside as some people thought originally, because you got nice thin and ladder. But Len spent a lot of time actually using the very sophisticated cut anal analysis of cutting pattern. And from that we deduced it had to be two superhelical turns um, around, around the histone optimer. And actually, I'm not talking about my own work, but my thesis work was born out of the linking number paradox that France identified because uh, from lens work, we knew that the helical periodicity of the DNA on the nucleosome was close to 10. And from the linking number paradox was when if you took something like S340 mini chromosome and you removed all the histones, you only saw 20 negative supercoils. So you should have seen 40. So what was the helical periodicity of DNA in solution? And I spent two years showing it was 10.6. So, <laughs> and that resolved the linking number paradox. And Caroline said it took another 30 years. And what she did not say is uh, that it's actually during this time that synchrotron radiation was developed. And, and later on, actually, I sent some of my, I, I had also not just old Kiarami crystal, I had old nutrients of old crystals and sent them to, because they had no organic solvent in, and they were in a stopped tube, they knew forever. A mixed sequence DNA nucleus on core diffract to 2.5 at the synchrotron. And then, you know, his Nobel Prize, and I'm gonna run out of time. Um, which has already been quoted, and that the fact that he got it alone. And again, I remember the day Aaron got the Nobel Prize. It was, of course, during the lab lecture week, and I was loading a gel. And, and, and Mike Fuller came running and said, Daniela, Aaron has won the Nobel Prize. So I finished loading my gel and put the power on and ran downstairs. 
and Aaron's office door was always open. And Aaron just put the phone down and he looked completely dazed. And, and I said, congratulations, Aaron. And he stared at me and he said, you know, I won it by myself. I didn't realize. I said, it's only when Liebe asked me, he had been talking to his wife, Liebe had asked me, who did you share with, share it with, that he realized he'd won it by himself. And then we, we together went into the lecture theater. As you know, Aaron always sat at the front. He walked down, sat at the front. And there were three talks that afternoon. And Aaron just sat there and asked his usual questions. And Max was the chair and someone walked in and gave Max a piece of paper. But they waited until the session finished. And then they announced that Aaron had won it that first. Very LMB style. Uh, also, the genius of Aaron, I think, uh, I think all who worked with him know it, but I think to me it was his amazing ability of putting different bits of information together. You know, he had incredibly vast, vast knowledge and he had photographic memory. Someone else mentioned, I was forever surprised being in his office talking about something. And it is shelf full of brown folders. And he could just stand up, go to a brown folder, pull out the paper and say, on the second page, it says, you know. Um, and, uh, and since we have time, nobody, there is no, uh, nobody's talking directly on Zing Fingers. I, I would say that I think the Zing Finger story is another example of Aaron's you know, way of thinking on how to put things together. And uh, someone mentioned uh, that we had this, we had a very messy student who could never produce this protein intact. But only Aaron noticed that the there was a ladder of bands. It wasn't the smear of proteolysis. And then Ray Brown and I were sent a sequence, I think from Bob Roder's lab. And we gave it to Aaron. And next day he came in and he had the frog, uh, you know, the, he had simply looked at the sequence and noticed that the fatty amino acid was a persistent in histidine. And then he told me, and I know the chelate thing because the structure alcohol dehydrogenase, which had been done like in 1976, has a zinc atom in the catalytic pocket. I mean, one point is the active site, point of attack, but the other three, ligands or systems and histidines. And then of course, uh, and, and then we went on and we structured zinc finger protein and uh, Arab student, Ian Chu then went on and um, uh, made phage display library of zinc fingers to deduce the code of each zinc finger, which it's really like a code because each zinc finger recognizes three base pairs which meant you could string together any zinc finger or any number in zinc finger to recognize any DNA sequence, which was, I think, the, the first you could call gene editing mechanism because you, you could couple the zinc fingers to, um, you know, like a nucleus to cleave DNA. And I finish, just to say thank you, Aaron. And this is the last time I saw Aaron in the summer of 2014 when I think we had the celebration here in the lab and Len came uh, and we went to visit Aaron. And I think it's amazing that I have a picture with Casper and Krug. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>